do 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 do. Our special guest today, do 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 do, is very special. Do 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 do. He's done a million commercials. Do 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 do. You've seen him on a million TV shows. Do 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 do. And now he's with Skippy Low. It's Art Matrano. <laughs> Art Matrano um, grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Bensonhurst. Bensonhurst, my. At what age Art started, decided he wanted to become an actor or comic? Basically comic, right? No, actually I wanted to be an actor. Oh, really? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I really, uh, you know, in high school, I, uh, all I was allowed to do was play uh, football because we had a football coach there that said if you played or did anything else mm -hmm. in that school, you couldn't play football for right. him. But my senior year, I did a thing called The Sing, which is like a variety show that each uh, of the different uh, classes, uh, they, um, uh -huh. they played against each other from sophomores, juniors, you know, freshmen. And we did a sing, and we did um, musical acts. Uh -huh. And I did uh, Buddy Hackett's Chinese Waiter. Which, uh, <laughs> I like that. Which um, uh -huh. everyone, you know, it was famous uh -huh. in those days. And, uh, and uh, that was the first time I ever appeared on stage uh, uh -huh. doing something and got a reaction from an audience, even though I stole uh -huh. the material. Uh -huh. And then right after that, I did one play in high school called Stage Door. Mm -hmm. And um, when that show was over, the, uh, this, the, the drama coach, the drama teacher said, Nancy Wilson, she said to me, um, Art, I think when you go to college, I know you're going to play football, uh -huh. but you walk like a cat on stage. <laughs> Take it seriously. Uh -huh. So when I got to college, I went to ca college in California in Stockton, uh, which is now called the University of Pacific. Really? Why Stockton? I had a football scholarship. Is that what it is? And it was the only scholarship I had that uh, uh -huh. was in California. Uh -huh. And I always wanted to go to California. Uh -huh. And little me from Brooklyn, I thought, uh, I thought California meant Hollywood. Uh -huh. I had no idea I was somewhere uh, <laughs> in, uh, you know, 30, like 40, 50 miles out of uh, San Francisco, uh -huh. you know. Studied with Stella Adler? That's right. Good teacher. Uh, Who else did you study? You some great teachers. Well, the first teacher I studied with was John Cassavetes. Cassavetes to wow. Stella Adler? I well, mean, when I first, mm. when I decided I wasn't going to finish college, that I right. wasn't going to be a professional football player, right. I wanted to be an actor. I uh, picked up a, a paper called Backstage, and there was a... Um, it's a big New York paper. That's right. No. It means nothing out here. No, New Yorkers know. Yeah. Go ahead. And uh, there was an article about John Cassavetes' uh, theater studio. Right. And I wanted to try out. Mm -hmm. He was giving out scholarships. Mm -hmm. And I must have weighed 265 pounds at the time, 19 and a half inch neck, no hair on my head, football player, I walked in there. <laughs> and the only thing I had, I had this piece that I was going to do was a piece by Walter Benton called This Is My Beloved. Oh. It was a bit of prose that, oh. I, had, that, I, had, uh, that I had memorized. And there I was on the stage doing This Is My Beloved, you know, <laughs> and this big body. And Cassavetti said, Art, I, I couldn't imagine anybody your size doing this, this poetry that a woman might be doing. You know? <laughs> and um, That's great. Yeah, he gave me a scholarship, though. And uh, I stayed in that school for almost two years when a friend of mine from high school had gone to Yale, uh -huh. decided that he wanted to do a scene for Stella Adler's um, workshop, and would I do the scene from Desperate Hours with him? Mm -hmm. So I said, sure. So we went there, and I'll never forget meeting Stella, Stella Adler. She was in that um, big chair, big throne, that throne chair. Boy, this wow. woman was, was that great. Yeah, I studied with her too. Ella. She was a bit scary. She was, wasn't she? She yeah. was great. Well, uh, funny. I'm just gonna uh, just go. Yeah. I never forget. After a while, when I studied with her, we she took a bunch of actors out on a what they call a field trip, mm -hmm. where she would make people, department store clerks, crazy, <laughs> and we went to Bergdorf Goodman. <laughs> And she was there trying on all these um, different kinds of gloves, you know, from uh -huh. opera length to leather to cotton to, and she was just saying, you know, she, oh, I'll try those on, me have those, and and she was kidding, but I'll try. And this woman was waiting on her like crazy, uh -huh. and finally, the woman said, you know, the way you speak, uh, are you an actress? <laughs> and Stella said, no, I, I'm just affected. <laughs> That's great. And the old, the, the whole idea yes. behind it was was to. To, to really try out your acting uh -huh. while you're out there while shopping. You're out shopping. While it, Is that what she do? used to do? Absolutely. I love it. That's great. She took us to Chinatown, <laughs> and we sat in a, uh, we stood in a, in, a, in a vegetable store <laughs> with all these Chinese men who sat around in a circle uh -huh. 
and didn't talk, Skip. <laughs> That's funny. And she just wanted us to watch them. Uh -huh. To see how silent they were, to see how their body language was, oh. to see how they went through their day so you could know what it would like to be Chinese. Jeez, isn't it great? I mean, it was pretty That's amazing great. stuff. Mm. It didn't really sink uh -huh. in, but after a while, after you went a while and she would discuss this with you, you realized uh -huh. what, her, what her motives were, and they were really yeah. very, you know... Stella and uh, Actor Studio had two different ideas. Yeah, I and think you so. went to Actor Studio, didn't you? No. Or studied with someone at the Actor Studio? Uh, no, I, I, I studied Cousin, with Harold you, Clerman. You, how, that's right. Absolutely, Clerman was. He's uh, Actor Studio. Yeah, but he was he's quite an incredible man. I mean, I uh, mean, uh, from Stella Adler to him. Well, what that's, happened was it that's was, good though because you got both. Yeah. Well, she, he had a, what he had was a uh, uh, not a workshop. But he had a professional acting class that he taught up at Carnegie Hall at 11 o'clock at night for all the actors that were studying on, bro that were in, on Broadway yes. shows. Right, to come down. Right. And, um, <laughs> and he taught them, and Harold Clement, and he played, and we'll get the parts, and we'll do it. <laughs> and he liked the parts of press, and he and he was uh, just wild. Uh -huh. He always had this young babe with him, you know. Uh -huh. And I knew that he had been married to uh -huh. Stella because uh -huh. she would, you know, talk about Harold. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was amazing. I mean, uh, uh -huh. and he loved the actors that came from Stella's class uh -huh. because he understood her work. Because they all were with the group theater, you know. He right, wrote those right. Books, group, you know? of course. I That's mean, it. Kazan and Garfield and yep, Stella and uh, interesting stuff. Art, stand-up comic. When did that all begin? Because you worked at Tropicana, you worked all over. You were in Mer Ed Sullivan shows. Yeah. Well, when did that begin? I was uh, actually just trying to find my way in New York, and I couldn't get as, it. As, as an actor as or in show business? As anything. In show business, As right. anything. Right, you right. Know? Go ahead. I was studying acting. I, uh, you know, I was with, you know, as I said, all these other acting coaches. And uh -huh. uh, I went to a thing by Robert uh, Q. Lewis, who had mm -hmm. this comedy uh, class right. at the Variety Arts Building. Uh, and I studied there, too, with did him. Did you? I did. <laughs> and, uh, That's funny. Isn't that, Robert you know? Q. Lewis. Uh, You're right. Would put people together, or try to learn how mm -hmm. to do, uh, how to le how to learn how to do a comedy hunk. Hunk, yes. And I knew the um, the famous Buddy Hackett routine, uh, the Chinese way. So Buddy Hackett really encouraged oh, uh, Art Matrano oh, into showbiz. Because huh? oh, do you ever see Buddy Hackett say, "Listen, uh, Buddy, I." I do told him I told him that story the other day when I met him in an art gallery, uh -huh. and he said, "Yeah, you know, my uh, my son, uh, my son did, did that also." And uh, Sandy and Sandy, and he won a big award. And I said, "Well, so did I." You know, and, uh, so that's what did you do? Work the mountains? Or? I worked the mountains. I found a partner. We weren't very good. You uh, had a team. You were a team. We were a team. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had so many different names. You know, every time we fail, we changed our names. <laughs> you ever worked for Johnny Martinelli or any of these people? Or? Yes, I did. Did you really? And the, and Charlie Rapp. And Rapp, Charlie and, Rapp on the Catskills. How about Aaron Toda? Did you know Aaron? She used to work the Catskills. Annie did you know and I. Aaron? We met Annie. No, I don't know Aaron Toda. Oh, no. Aaron Toda. I do. Yes, I do. He said, yeah. he said, listen, you want to work for me? I'll tell you what. He yeah. said, you'll do. He said, you're going to make uh, $75 on this job, but you got to pick up the dancer on the way up in the front. Right. And if you drive up to the thing and you you got a car, don't you? Yeah, that's and if it. you have a car, you got the job. But if you don't have a gun, you can't pick up the dancer, then you can't go with me. And it was the truth. That's if you didn't funny. have a car, you couldn't pick up I the know. dancer, you didn't have the job. Did a job. I said to him, I said, listen, Aaron, you're paying me $75. I said, by the time I drive up there, and I have to pay for the room, and I have a bite to eat, I said, it's going to cost me $100. He said, yeah, let me tell you something. These are the kind of jobs you have to save up for. <laughs> <laughs> these weekend, jo these weekend yeah, jobs are great. Uh, that's how I met Annie oh, that's on the so Catskills. Funny. We worked together, I mean, right? True. Yeah. Uh, how many partners did you have? How many? Oh, I had, uh, let's see, Dick Towers and Danny Winston. I know Dick Towers. You were with Dick Towers? Dick Tall Dick? Yes. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. You know Dick. <laughs> yes, very well, <laughs> years ago. Me, at the B&G. Me, 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 at B&G's. You ever hang around B&G's? Yeah, of course. I didn't know that, Oh, the B&G. Everyone yeah. hung around the B&G. Yeah, go ahead. That's where all the comics and all the writers and all the would-bes and the Leslie brothers. Right. Of course. Good God. So anyway, how many... So I, I, I just started doing this, this, the, this act, this uh -huh. terrible act, and we would steal from the best and, you know... <laughs> steal we, from we, the best. Yeah, God. absolutely, because we That's knew right. we were going to be out of town anyway. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they didn't have comedy clubs like they have now that are on, you know, the uh -huh. improv and, uh -huh. you know, the laugh stop and all these television shows, which is now a really good place to steal. Uh -huh. If you want to be a comic, it's perfect, because yes, now right. you got a VCR, you can really get their material. Uh -huh. um, and we would travel and do all these little... What they call kuchelains. Yes, right. And a kuchelain up in the castle meant 
that people lived in bungalows but had no cooking facility. But they had one big bungalow that had all the cooking facilities, so uh -huh. all the families would cook in a cook lane. Uh -huh. They would That's cook in a cook lane. <laughs> I love it. And you'd have all these Jewish families, you uh -huh. know, with all these different stoves and refrigerators that belonged to the Weissmans, to the Goldbergs, to the Shapiros. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Thank God we had a name named Messestrano. No one thought we were Jewish. You see. <laughs> so they were a little afraid of us. They thought we were the mafia, you know. <laughs> the Messestranos are showing up to cook, clear the table. Then, commercials. Got lots of commercials. Did became, lots of those when became I became a hit started. on commercials. Yeah. Art Matrano. Yeah, it helped Loves. a lot. That helped really helped your career, didn't it? Well, I think what really helped my career was the routine that Annie was doing uh, early on. I. Uh, but you did it better. <laughs> well, I hope so. Go ahead, Art. Well, what happened was that I was at a party. Uh, it was a Christmas party at Rudy DeLuca, uh -huh. who's a writer who works a lot with Mel Brooks. And, right. Uh, there was uh, oh, all these guys that were Barry Levinson, uh -huh. um, Craig Nelson. They were all in a, uh, we were all doing a show called Loman and Barkley. Of course. And um, one night at Rudy's, we were all getting pretty smashed, uh, drinking a little too much, uh, smoking some dope, uh -huh. okay. And we did all those nonsensical things that we don't do anymore. And I came up with this idea. Right. Which everyone was entertaining everyone. And I started going, da, 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 da. Uh -huh. And all I did was take out a handkerchief and I stuck it in my hand uh -huh. and I pulled it out from the bottom and people started to laugh. Right. And the next morning, Rudy said, Art, you got to do this on the show, Loman Barkley. And that was mm -hmm. on NBC. Uh, mm -hmm. and we, we played at 11.30 at night on Sunday nights. And I went on and I did this comedy magic act. Right. And the audience went crazy. And then I got a call from the Carson Show to go to New York, from where my hometown, right. to fly back to New York to do a piece Johnny of Carson. And Carson, uh, who was uh, Yes, he uh, loved magic. Loved magic. Loved magic. I didn't know. I had and no idea. And he loved you. I remember that. Well, he, uh, he actually fell off. Uh -huh. He had, you know, one of those swivel uh -huh. chairs. Uh -huh. And he was laughing so hard as I turned to look at him as I was doing one of my tricks. He laughed and he fell backwards. <laughs> and I went, oh, my God. I said, he really likes me. <laughs> and I was told that night, the very first time I ever did the Carson show, that he won't have time to speak to you tonight. So just do the five minutes of your hunk. And then come take your bow and come back, mm -hmm. you know, come off. Well, I had finished this piece and I had taken my bow, and Johnny had come from his seat down to congratulate right, me and thank right, me. Right. And I said, Come on, come on. And he ushered me back into this chair, uh -huh. of which I was never going to sit because I was already told, right. You know, you're not going to sit tonight. There's no yeah. sit down talk. And uh, Johnny started to talk to me. And he loved you. Yeah, he did. Art. That acting you studied in New York mm -hmm. paid off big. You went to London, light up the sky. Right. Uh, was Bobby Morris in that with you? Uh, uh, no, well, Robert did it in London. He did it for the did, same did, producer oh. yes. at a different theater, theater a few years before. And, right. Um, I remember he went to London. What happened was I was on tour. Right. In the, in the Far East. I was with uh, Jonathan Winters and uh, Dionne Warwick. Right. And we were entertaining uh, these various groups in, uh, you know, all over the Far East. Right. And I got this call as I hit, as we hit, finally hit the, the only place that we were going to have R&R. &R. I was in Bali and I had never been to Bali and uh, I had mm -hmm. spent one day traveling through the little township. By the way, in, in that little township there was a bunch of these kids and, um, I was doing my routine on this routine. tour, so I started doing that because you know there was right. no, there's no barrier, there's no, uh, you know, and I did it, and the kids started doing, picking it up, and I was like the Pied Piper. I was walking down these little, uh, these little streets where all these huts were, you know, uh -huh. where people lived. It was just a, a pa paradise, <laughs> and these kids were going da 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 da, <laughs> and we were traveling through this little town. And when I got back to the hotel, there was a message from the states that uh -huh. my manager had called and uh -huh. would be calling me later. Uh -huh. Fine, I had no idea. Uh -huh. Three o'clock in the morning, my phone is ringing. I get up, I pick up the phone, and it's my manager telling me, listen, they've offered uh, a part to one of my clients, another right. client he had, Joe Bologna, uh, uh -huh. of a part in Light Up the Sky. Do you know the play? I said, no, I've heard about it. I said, who wrote it? He said, Morse Hart. I said, oh, God, Morse Hart. I said, yeah, so what do they want? Well, Joe can't do it, and I sent you a tape and your reviews from Fatty Arbuckle. Uh -huh. Uh, which I had recently done, Fatty, at the Tiffany You did Theater. at the Tiffany. I saw you there. And we'll he, talk about that in a minute. And he's, they sent this off, and they're very interested, and they want you to go to London to star in the play. I said, okay, when do I do this? He said, right away, you got to pack tomorrow. The Globe <laughs> Theater. The Globe Theater. Shakespearean Theater. Wow. So I said, how can I leave tomorrow? I said, I'm in, I, I have, you know, 
tie-dye right. clothing with me. Yeah, yeah. Shorts and little <laughs> tee tops. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, I've got my flippers and my suntan lotion. Uh -huh. I said, uh -huh. how much? They said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I've got to go home and get some clothing if I'm going to go to London. Yeah. So very quickly I made reservations, got onto a plane, leaving Bali, crossing I don't know how many time zones until right. I got home, saw my wife and children, kissed them. They knew what was going on. They already had this little playbill that was uh, this, the play right. sent to them. I packed some clothes. Sunday I got back on a plane and crossed all these other time zones. Mm -hmm. I'm on the plane going first class to London my very first time. You don't uh -huh. know how charged I am. Uh -huh. Reading a play that uh, I'm trying to learn and breaking out in a cold sore <laughs> from all this Ex stuff that was going on, anxiety, right. oh, uh, crossing time zones, uh -huh. not sleeping. I don't know if I was supposed to go to the bathroom, I was supposed to go to sleep, I was supposed, <laughs> supposed to wake up. Well, what am I eating? Am I having lunches or dinner? <laughs> I mean, I was, I, know. I was really messed. And they drive me, mm -hmm. they pick me up at the, uh, the, the, the airport, airport in London, mm -hmm. and this cab driver, very British guy, said, waiting for Mr. Matrata having my, you know, <laughs> so I get into the car, and this, you know, they drive me to this theater, and uh, they're rehearsing at the Queen's Theater, which is right behind the Globe. Globe, yes. And it was like an old movie. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm walking in, and uh, all the actors had been in rehearsal already for 10 days. Right, right. And the only reason why they didn't use Bob Moore is because they felt... Not, not that he's... He already did it. He already did it, and they didn't think he was really the right type. Right. Because the guy that originated it was Sam Levine on Broadway. That's right, that's right. So, um... He did. Here I go, I'm walking on, I'm coming to the backstage, and they're walking me up to the stage, and I see they're in rehearsal, and everyone stops because they've been waiting uh -huh. for someone to play this lead role of Sidney Black, uh -huh. the producer. So, actor start. The, the director, Elijah Moshinsky, <laughs> comes up and says, Oh, please, everyone, uh, hold on one moment. We, uh, uh, Art Matranov is here. I'd like to introduce you. Uh, he's playing Sidney Black, the uh, producer. So one by one, the actors come up, and they shake their hands, and they say, Hello, my name is Kate O'Mara. I'm playing your wife. Nice to meet you, Kate. <laughs> Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I'm playing... My name is Maxine Audley, and I'm playing your mother-in-law. Yes. Uh -huh. Hello, my name is Leo McGuire. I'm playing the drunk in the third row. Yes, uh -huh. all right. And finally, this guy comes up to me and says, Hi, my name is Paul Maxwell, and I'm playing the author. Paul and I, Maxwell. Now I look at him right in the face, and I said, Paul, that's not your name. And all the other actors are looking at me. Uh -huh. I said, Your name is Maxim Popovich, and you are my drama teacher at <gasps> University of Pacific in Stockton, California. You're oh kidding. My How gosh. wonderful. And he looked at me like, Ah, how wonderful. And everybody thought, who's this mad person from <laughs> Los Angeles arriving and telling Paul yes. Maxwell that his name is Max and Max Papa? I mean, Maxwell. it was really weird. Great, great. And he looked at me and he goes, you're right. I did teach drama. And he remembered. He wasn't sure. <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't sure. He looked at me uh -huh. and he said, because my name was Art Matrano. Right. And in college, my name was Arthur Messistrano. Yeah. That was my name. Okay. The next day he comes back. And we're in rehearsal, and he comes up to me very quietly. Uh -huh. and he said, can we go to lunch today? I said, I'd love to, Paul. Mm -hmm. We went to lunch, and he sat down to tell me that for the last 20 years of his life, he thought he did nothing but waste his career by teaching in college, oh. by doing all that work that he thought was meaningless in his life. Uh -huh. He did it because he always wanted to be an actor, and he couldn't right, get a job, and right, so he became right. a teacher, and you know, he taught drama, and he thought it was the, the, the worst time of his life. Until the day I walked on that stage yes, the other day, mm -hmm. yesterday, he said, and you came on that stage, knew my name, and, 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 and that I was your drama coach, and you're playing the lead in this play. He said, you don't know how that made me feel. I went back, and I looked at everything mm -hmm. that, and I saw all the plays you did for me. I did right. Harry Ape, Mrs. McThing, uh -huh. Winter Set, mm -hmm. uh, The Time of Your Life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did all these plays. That's great. Art, looking back, You've had some hard times in your life. Huh. Uh, I mean, hard times, something came up very bad in your life. One afternoon, fell off the ladder. Tell broke me about neck. that. Was it broke your neck? Yeah. Wait, that you said just broke, that's, whew, what happened that day? Tell well, me. it was really a great day. It started off as a great day. Um, I, uh, I had finished, well, actually, that year I had just finished a movie, uh, April, May. I right. had just come back from Europe. I did a, a movie in Spain. Um, 
Um, I was up for a pilot. Uh, this is 1989. 1989, up for a television pilot, <gasps> up for a terrific movie. Right. I, I had been doing the, uh, the series of uh, Police Academy movies. Right. Um, I was building a house, uh, uh, remodeling a house for resale, strictly to make some right. extra cash. Right, right. And um, I had just finished playing tennis, and I, and I knew there was going to be an open house, and I wanted to make sure everything was perfect, right? Right, right. Uh, the, the whole entire house was really white, including the white Berber carpeting, and it was really it was a stunning house. Right. And it was three levels. And I, I, I knew that a, a week or two before that the uh, pool company had come and what they called gunited the pool. Right. It's like a soft cement yes. making the shell just before you plaster and do all the tile work. And I wanted to make sure everything was okay because the, right. the house was done finished beautiful right just the exterior the landscaping yes. in the pool wasn't right so I went down there to take a look at it and I looked back on the wall and I noticed there was gunite spray everywhere mm -hmm. so I started washing it off with this hose and I scraped it there there was a, a razor blade and I was scraping some of the stuff off the French doors that led out to the pool area right. and the hose got out of my hand for a moment and shot water up to and it hit the balcony and I walked away to duck away from the balcony and the water was dripping and I saw all this smut right. coming down, all this gray stuff. Right. And I said, oh my God, this, this gunite is everywhere. Right. So I grabbed a ladder and a hose and the only reason why I did that to clean it off is because of the white carpeting. I knew they were going to open up the doors, right, right. they were going to step out on this balcony, they don't yeah, care, course. they didn't see the dirt, and then walk back on and just get the, the Berber carpeting dirty. So for that reason, I climbed up, started to wash off, all of a sudden, I found myself falling, and I hit it. I, I, I fell to the ground so fast, Skip, I hit the top of my neck, and I heard a snap, and I watched my right hand go like this. Ooh. And I went, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I right. tried to move, and I couldn't move. You couldn't move at all? From the neck down. Who's there? Anyone around Nobody. the house? The house was totally empty. It was a remodel. My, 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 my wife and my kids were at the Roxbury Park. I knew, I knew where they were. I knew I had just finished How playing. long did you have to stay this way? I was there about 45 minutes to an hour. Before anyone came? What happened was the neighbor's dog started to bark because I was moaning. Right. When I first, I went, oh, I, I said, my God, my tongue is stuck in the back of my, because I had a. You couldn't even talk. I couldn't talk. And I, my breathing was weird. And, I, and, I, and when I finally said, let me try to do this one more time. Help me. I was really concentrating. And I started to laugh when I said, right. help me. Because I said, oh, my God. I, I turned myself into Lou Ferrigno. Right. I, I remember oh. when I worked for Lou Ferrigno with Lou oh. on the show called The Incredible Hulk, Lou was born deaf. Yes. And so he couldn't speak good. Yes. And when he came into my dressing room, he said, hi, my name is Lou Ferrigno. Yes, yes, and yes. we're going to do a scene together, yes. and I'm going to throw you through the window. Oh. And I started to laugh. I said, oh, my God. You look. started to laugh then? I laughed. Even in the pain? In you the were, pain. Because I, I were you in pain? I didn't feel pain. I just felt I was scared. I couldn't breathe. The scariest thing was I couldn't breathe, and my tongue was stuck in the back of my throat. Right. See, I didn't know what had happened was that I had broken my neck in three places. Broken the first, second, neck. and seventh vertebrae. The first two are called, when you break that, it's called a hangman's break. Right. When you kill someone in an yes. execution, you hang them, those two vertebrae snap. So, Art, who, so, who found you? Well, a neighbor, uh, the dog started to bark, and then a neighbor called over the fence, she said, is that you, Art? And I said, yeah, it's me, Pat, help yes, me. Yes. I'm paralyzed. And she said, it's OK, Art, T take it easy. I'm calling 911. Don't move. She didn't panic at all, did she? <laughs> Don't move, Don't she move. Told you. And I laughed. I said, all right, I'll, I'll stay right where I am. So, Art, <laughs> this tragedy thing, awful. You were in the hospital for a long time. Two months. At Cedars? Cedars Sinai. Two medicine. months. Two months. Because I came to visit you once. I was at. I was seeing um, Cornel my friend Weil. Cornell Weil. Hey, rest in peace. And, yes, and you were in the down the hall there, and right. I saw you with this halo. Right. And I didn't know what it was because this friend of mine, Harvey Fisher, used to visit you. Right. And he told me about the incident. Right. Well, Harvey told and, me about Cornell, right. but didn't know. Couldn't think of the actor's name. So there's a very, there's an right. actor who did all those dashing movies with a sword and right. whatever and I can't think of his name and he's here with right. the terrible cancer and I and said I know you walked down the aisle and well you came I said well what happened was I said to Harvey I said Cornell Wilde uh -huh. and he said yeah how did you know I said I don't know but 
it sounds like Cornell. And I said, uh -huh. he said, do you know him? I said, well, the last three years I've been having dinner up at Hef's Mansion, uh -huh. watching movies, and having dinner. And every uh, yes, Friday and Sunday night, I would sit with Cornell and talk to him uh -huh. about the naked prey and Chopin. And you two were there at the hospital at the same time. That's right. Tell me about the experience in the hospital. You, you made up your mind. The doctors gave you paralyzed. You made up your mind to fight this. Art, well, not how in the, did you do this? Well, it wasn't in the beginning. In the beginning, I was, you I, were, was I was scared to death. I was frustrated. I was angry. I mean, God. You I, thought you would never walk again or ah, God, I work again? Feel. I got tubes in, up my nose I and know, my I penis saw in my arms. Awful. I mean, you know, it's a strange thing to be, uh, to be buried alive in your own body. And right. I was scared. I mean, I would itch and I, I couldn't get the itch and, you know, I couldn't ring the call button. I mean, I was helpless. And I had never been helpless before. I mean, totally immobile. Right. And that scared me. And then when they finally transferred, transferred me from one particular section of the hospital, which was the acute section, right. to the rehab. Rehab. That's and where I it said, all began. I said, okay, now I'm going to go out and, and do something. And I remember having the nurse dress me in all my Nike stuff. Right. Nike shoes, Nike sneakers, <laughs> Nike shorts, Nike this, Nike gloves, <laughs> Nike headband. I even had a Nike swoosh on my plate uh, where I had this thing screwed in uh -huh. my head. And I'm lying there. And I had this tape of, the, of Stallone's Rocky theme, uh -huh. you, know, you know, getting stronger. Yeah, right. And I'm lying there, and I'm laughing because I can't move a muscle, and I'm, oh. I'm dressed like I'm going to run a marathon, <sighs> and I'm listening to this music, and I'm laughing there. I'm just laughing. You kept your sense of humor, didn't you? That's right. You kept your sense of humor, and you fought this. Well, and you, you got a, you've got an award for this. You got an award. Yes, I did. Tell me about that. Well, it was just that. Uh, what happened was, is I found myself wheeling, being wheeled down this this hallway to you hell. You didn't want to be. Oh. Well, what happened was I saw, you know, a man with no legs, a, a, a man, another man with a scar that went from here to the back of his head. His head was shaven, and he was, he was staring off, and you know, you know, like into oblivion, just right. you know, babbling. And then another woman was all crippled up and drooling, right. and, and no one was cleaning her up, and she was all, uh -huh. I mean, like one person was like going down this hallway to hell. Right. And I couldn't wait till I got into the elevator because I was just like wiped out from seeing all these people in so much pain. And they were older than I were, uh, than I was, and they were, I don't know, given up. But you up made up your mind that I was going to wake them up. Wake them up, yeah, you did it. Well, they all had their and heads then, down. You then know? you helped these other people, and then you got this award, and then. Well, you our, see, by uh, helping, I, I don't want to let you go. By helping these other people, it helped yourself. It helped me. Did it? Because I made them laugh. Uh -huh. I mean, I would say to them, I would say to, her, hey, Rhoda, straighten. She had a stroke. I said, Rhoda, straighten out your arm. Come on. Hey, I'm fine. Come on, Rhoda. Listen, I mean, where else can you get? I used, to, I, I used to tell her, isn't a hospital a great place? And you right. get uh, three meals a day, mm -hmm. all the drugs you want, and they expect you yeah. to pee in your bed, Rhoda. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, that's right. So you really, you really helped a lot. And I you? just, I made them laugh. You wrote a play about this. You wrote a one-man play called... Art Matrano in Twice Blessing. Twi where is Twice Blessed. Twice Blessed. Now, where is it, it playing now? It, it's playing at the Celebrity Center where you... And it's a all about your life story. Right. Well, the, the You're cat telling the truth. The cat... Well, all the truth about you, the one-man show, and I hear, it's, I hear it's great. The catalyst for this play. Charles Burke grew yes. up where? Los Angeles? Born and raised Born in, in Los Angeles. How did you get into architectural designing? You're one, one of the number one architectural designer in New York City, matter of fact. Well, interestingly, I left California as a teenager uh -huh. and uh, went to New York City as an apprentice for Howard Rothberg, right. who at the time 
uh, in the late 50s was the premier designer in New York. Uh -huh. And um, my career evolved from uh, being, I was very fortunate to have been one of the uh, last of the apprentices in the industry, okay. I think. How does a person become an architectural designer? Uh, well, at what age did you decide? I think it's. I think you. Uh, I think it's something that you're either born to, uh, to do or not to do. Uh -huh. and, I, and I had a, an aspiration to design when I was a child, and, and I used to build from blocks uh -huh. to sketching to. Were you the man around the house, decorating your mother's home? Oh, absolutely not. No. <laughs> no. Really. It wasn't allowed. No. Uh -huh. I had to do it in my mind. In your mind. In my mind. And I used to see this. I used to see a city in my mind when I would go to sleep at night as a child. Uh huh. A very large city. Right. And uh, when I was about 17, I, I found my way to New York City and began as a uh, in window display. Mm -hmm. At, at uh, well, that's Lord, the Lord and Taylor. Lord yeah. and Taylor. Yeah. Okay. At 17. At 17. Okay. And then what happened from there? Uh, well, from I from Lord and Taylor. Uh, I went to. A, I was invited one evening to a, a very interesting uh, dinner party mm -hmm. at the home of a famous designer, and I was excited. I I didn't have formal clothes. I had to borrow them from uh -huh. the display department, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and um, at the dinner.